And this is Book TV on C-SPAN 2. We are in London interviewing authors, and we want to introduce you to author Judith Flanders, who now joins us. Judith Flanders writes about the Victorian era in many of her books. Ms. Flanders, what is the Victorian era when we talk about that? Well, the Victorian era is technically um, the period in which Queen Victoria reigned. So it is technically 1837 to 1901. Um, I'm not very technical. I cheat a lot. So my books cover what we politely call the long 19th century, which sometimes starts in the 18th century. So sometimes I discuss things that happened in the run-up to Queen Victoria. And often it goes to the beginning of World War I in 1914, which is actually a much more logical break when things changed very radically again. Was it known as a Victorian era at that time? Um, a little bit. Not the way we know it, no. Because apart from anything else, of course, it's much easier to call something an era once you know when it's going to end. And they didn't, and they didn't know it was going to be one of the longest reigns in British history and cover, really, the greater part of a century. I mean, you couldn't imagine that would happen. Why was it one of the greatest periods in British history? No, just the longest. Longest period um, in No, no, I'm, I'm not passing personal judgments here. Um, I like the Victorians, but not everybody does. Uh, if you had to describe that era in British history, though, how would you describe it? I think of it as a time of possibility. What I like, I mean, yes, there, there was dreadful stuff. If you read Dickens, if you read lots of 19th century novelists, there's all this terrible factory system that comes from the Industrial Revolution. There's tremendous poverty. There, there, there are undoubtedly dreadful things that went on in the 19th century. But it was an era of hope and the idea that the future was going to be better. And we've got very cynical and it often looks and fearful. We think the future is bound to be worse. Um, I like the idea that things could get better and if we work for a better society, we can produce a better society. And even saying those words today sounds so goody-goody, but in the 19th century, they really believed it and that's rather moving, I find. Was there a big class division during that time? Enormous. Um, in many ways, um, for a Victorian his historian, now is not a happy time to live because I see a lot of the worst of the 19th century happening again, the very large division between the very richest and the very poorest happening again. The whole thing of even people in work, often good work, unable to live decently, in decent housing, feed and clothe their children adequately. You see that then, you see it now, you, you saw it now as well as then. And so a lot of what we're seeing as a historian, you want to cover your eyes and say, don't do that, don't do that, we did it, it was terrible, don't do it again. Your book, A Circle of Sisters, mm -hmm. who is that about? Well, um, the book I always, when I explain it to Americans, it's very funny because I say that these were four women who were married to or the children of, um, or, or had, or sorry, married to or the parents of very famous people who you in America have never heard of. Um, so it's less exciting perhaps. But basically, um, one was married to the pre-Raphaelite painter Edward Byrne Jones. Um, one was the mother of Rudyard Kipling, who in America you have heard of. One was the um, mother of Stanley Baldwin, who was a British Prime Minister. So Kipling and Baldwin were first cousins. And one was married to a then very famous um, painter, now very little known. And if you've seen the pictures, there's a reason he's really not very well known. Um, but he helped set up the Tate Gallery, so he was, in administrative art terms, very important. And these were sisters? And they were four sisters. They were the children of a not very prosperous Methodist minister in the North, and they just happened somehow. And how did they come from the North, uh, daughters of a vicar, mm -hmm. and become well-known women or, or prosperous women? Um, uh, happenstance, really. Um, 
the mother of Kipling married a not very successful artist um, who became an arts administrator in India, so that's chance. Um, the wife of Byrne Jones married a then not at all successful painter who happened to have gone to school with her brother. Um, so that was happenstance. Um, the only one who actually married well was the one who married Baldwin. They were a very prosperous family. They were what were known as iron founders, um, which means that they had um, the equivalent of steel mills today. Um, and they, they were very wealthy. But um, and, and she knew him through the Methodist Church. Um, but otherwise, just happened. Where did you find their story, and why did you find them compelling? I found the story, um, I was reading a biography of Kipling, and I saw something that said, you know, his first cousin Stanley Baldwin. I thought, how on earth was Kipling's first cousin Stanley Baldwin? And then it said something about going to stay with his aunt and uncle, the Byrne Joneses, and I thought, how did that happen? And so I did a little research, and I found there was this extraordinary um, group and I did what we all do, which is I thought, hmm, one day I should do something about that. And then I went on with my life for 15 years. Um, I was a publisher, and I was perfectly happy being a publisher. I had no plans to write a book. And then things changed, and I thought one day, hmm, I am going to do something about that. Were they, did they live during the Victorian era? They did, um, almost precisely. Um, I wrote the book 15 years ago, so if you're going to check on the dates now, that's going to be interesting. Um, one of them was born in 1820, I do remember that, and she was one of the younger ones. So, yes, I mean, they all lived from the early part of the 19th century. I think one ultimately died in about 1910, 20. She was the last. So one of the things that attracted me was, apart from the fact that you had a politician, you had two painters, you had a writer, which meant you could cover um, British cultural life, at least, and some political life through these lives. It also meant that I could cover almost a century and see how things had changed there. Judith Flanders, you mentioned that you were a publisher. I was. Where? Oh, lots of places. I worked um, I worked for Penguin. I worked for Thames and Hudson, who publish art books. I worked for a publisher named Weidenfeld and Nicholson. I even briefly, very briefly, worked in the publications department of a museum. Um, and then I fled. Why? Uh, actually, because I had a nervous breakdown. Um, publishing, great stuff. <laughs> um, things got difficult and so I thought right time for a change and you started becoming an author yeah I took three weeks holiday a which in England we get and I went to the library and I did research on these women and I wrote a proposal and I called a couple of agents I knew and of course I was in an enormously privileged position in that I could just call up agents because I knew them and said you may want to faint with horror at the idea, but I've written this proposal. Do you want to look at it? And one of the agents said he wanted to take me on, and he said the best advice anyone ever gives an author, um, don't give up the day job. So I gave up the day job, and here I am. We've heard that from a couple of the authors here in London that we've interviewed, that uh, it's hard to be in England a writer solely. You have to be a writer and X. Yeah. It's very difficult. Um, you have to remember, apart from anything else about the changing economic climate, the changing reading habits, um, just the sheer population difference in our two countries and therefore the sheer number of people who will buy books, even if you do well. Um, 300 million in the States-ish? Plus. Mm, yeah. 60 million here. So if you have the same number of people who buy books, it's an awful lot less. Judith Flanders, your most recent book, The Invention of Murder, what's that about? It's not my most recent book, but I'm delighted to talk about it. Did it's people not... lie to you again? <laughs> they did. What, what is your most Terrible recent book? Terrible, they're liars. I've written a book called The Victorian City, which is subtitled Everyday Life in um, Dickens, London. 
and I wrote a book. Uh, my second book was called The Victorian House, and I walked through um, a standard row house um, in middle-class row house as they existed in the 19th century, and I looked at how people lived in the houses.